Right, so we've got phones off, ringtones down. <clears throat> well, let's start with a prayer then. Heavenly Father, through the Lord, we come to you and we, we ask that you'll open our eyes to your word as we go on now through Acts chapter 9 and that you will speak to us and that you will guide us and that you will speak to the heart of each and every one of us and that we might go your way and have your special strength in our lives and souls. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. <laughs> right, well, Acts 9. So we've read about Paul getting converted, being baptised. Now we're going on to something that happened with Peter. It came to pass as Peter went throughout all regions, he came to the saints who dwelt at Lydda. Now, Peter, what do we know about Peter? Well, when you read his letters, he says that we, he includes himself, in the past used to spend our time at parties, drinking, and just following whatever our flesh told us to do. So, though Peter was a fisherman, he was uh, not, not a particularly pious, righteous, religious fisherman. He says, we, including himself, used to do this kind of thing. And then he meets Jesus, and he's baptised and converted and all that, but then he denies Jesus, and... He's very sorry about that, but the very guy who publicly, it says, cursed and, and swore that I don't know Jesus, when they say to him, you were with Jesus, he says, I curse and I swear that I don't know him. And he says this three times. And then he, he goes out and he weeps bitterly, because Jesus had said, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. But then he comes to himself and he goes back to Jesus after Jesus has risen from the dead. And Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? It's as if he's trying to undo the three times when Peter said, I, I don't know the guy, Jesus, nothing to do with him. Curse, swear, etc. And Jesus says to him each time, okay, feed my sheep. So he goes out after that, preaching and helping people and caring for people like a shepherd all motivated by the fact that I messed up, that I denied Jesus, that I was the worst, but I'm forgiven. And so on that basis, that's the basis upon which we can be helpful to other people. If you don't have that humility, if you haven't got that experience of forgiveness, of realising that you messed up, but the Lord has been so great, gracious and gentle with you, you won't keep on keeping on in caring for people. So that's what he's doing. He goes throughout all regions and he came to the saints who lived in Lydda. Now a saint literally means a special person, a holy person, a chosen person. The problem is that we get the impression from particularly the Catholic Church that there's only some people who are saints. You go into the church there's these stained glass windows, these very white-faced, very pious people. Oh yes, that's St. Thomas. There's even St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, that's St. Thomas, that is St. whatever. But we, poor little things down here, we, we dirty sinners. I'm not a saint, I'm a sinner. Well, no, all the believers are called saints. We're all saints. In the sense that we're all special. We are all chosen. We are all God's holy people. So he comes to the saints, that is the believers, that's what it means, who live at Lydda. So these are people who had already become Christians. And there he found a certain man called Aeneas who'd been bedridden for eight years, so he was paralysed. Why tell us that this went on for eight years? Well, John the Baptist preached, it seems, for three and a half years. Then Jesus preached for three and a half years. And this is about a year later, after Jesus has ascended to heaven. So I reckon that this guy, for eight years, had been hearing the message but he hadn't responded. And you won't get away from it. When we are called, and we've all been called, we've all heard the gospel, you sooner or later have to, hands up, surrender. And well, he'd been paralyzed. So it looks like he's like coming right to the end. Shh, you're feeling okay? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm just making food. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Well, there's Peter standing over this paralyzed guy, and he doesn't say, da, 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 I am going to heal you. He says, Jesus Christ is going to heal you. 
In other words, he realised that he was, as it were, Jesus. Of course he wasn't Jesus, but that he was representing Jesus. And so I said yesterday that when you baptised, you baptised into the body of Jesus. Go under the water, that's like death with Jesus. You come up out of the water, it's like resurrection. You are in Christ. And so, as Mother Teresa said, Jesus has no other hands or legs or face or arms in this world apart from that of you and me. And that is what it means to be in Christ. To be, yeah, if you're going to keep interrupting, can you go outside? Sorry, I'm going to do outside. Right? So that's your first warning, right? You won't get another one. You have to go outside, right? Okay, so he says, Jesus Christ heals you, arise, make your bed, and immediately he arose. Now, Jesus in his ministry had cured people like that. He had healed them and told them, arise and make your bed. There was this uh, beggar guy out on the streets who had leprosy and was paralyzed, and Jesus also had said, oh, I, I touch you, I cure you, arise, make your bed, and go home. And so Peter is kind of repeating the style of Jesus. Because he says, Jesus Christ heals you. I am so connected with him that when I talk to you, it is as if this is Jesus talking to you. And he was so aware of how Jesus had acted and behaved, even down to his kind of body language, that he tried to behave and act in the same way. And so the New Testament talks about being in Christ. And what that means is that we are in this relationship with Jesus, that we are in him. I'm with him, he's with me, I'm part of him, he's part of me. When we take the bread and the juice, that bread represents his body. And we're saying, yes, I want to be in that body. And you get baptised above all, you show that, that yeah, I'm, I'm done with this sort of broadwalk life, I, I want to be in him and with him. Sorry, can you go outside? It's, it's, it's not okay to sit here laughing and, and hooting around. Can you just go outside? Come back and you're feeling a bit, uh, a bit calmer. Thanks. Thank you. So, and all that dwelt at Lydda and in Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. And what does that mean? All who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. <clears throat> doesn't mean that every single human being in Lydda or Sharon turned to the Lord. What does it mean? It says, and all of them in Lydda and Sharon turned to the Lord. Well, it's because, verse 32, he came to the saints who lived in Lydda. So, the believers. So, it means surely then that all the believers saw it and they turned to the Lord. But wait a minute, weren't they already with the Lord? I think this is an example of how you get reconverted. There's steps up the ladder. Like Jesus said to Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. But he could have said, but Lord, I'm already a convert. Yeah, Jesus knew he was already a convert. But he says, when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. So, the same here. These people are believers. They're saints. But when they see this, they turn to the Lord. Or you could say they turn back to the Lord. They, they come even stronger to him. So there are steps up the ladder. That's why, in my opinion, it's quite okay to be baptised a second time. You've got an example of that in Acts chapter 19, where it seems people were baptised by John the Baptist, by dipping in water, but then they came to a fuller understanding, and they, they got baptised again. It's like a recommitment to Jesus. So don't think that you can't be baptised a second time. You can be. So, <clears throat> there was at Joppa a certain disciple called Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds. Well, why has she got two names? Well, Tabitha is her Hebrew name and Dorcas is her Greek name. So, you could say that this woman was mixed race, half Jewish and half Greek. And the significance of that is that in chapter 10, the next chapter, you're going to read about a guy called Cornelius, who's a Roman, who's definitely, totally not a Jew, who wants to be baptised. And the disciples 
were Jews, of course, and it was very difficult for them to get their head around the fact that God wanted to save Gentiles. And this is a big theme in the New Testament, that the Jewish believers struggled to get their head around the fact that if you weren't a Jew, you could still be saved. To us, that's, that's obvious. That was the problem. But for them, it was not so obvious. For them, this was, no, 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 salvation is only for Jewish people. Well, Jesus himself had said, go into all the world, teach the gospel to all nations, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. You'd have thought that was clear enough. But even though that is clear enough that you should go and teach non-Jews the gospel, they didn't get it, the disciples didn't get it. And they struggled for many years to get this okay, that actually if you're not a Jew you can still be baptised. And so in chapter 8 we saw about the Ethiopian eunuch who was baptised by Philip in the middle of the desert. And that again was God sort of push, push, pushing, nudging, saying come on, Here's an Ethiopian guy, well, he wants to be baptised, go on Philip, baptise him. And now with Peter, the Lord is working very gently. He says, okay, Peter, I will introduce you to someone who is half Jewish and half Gentile. What do you make of that? If you're insistent that only the, um, only the Jews can be saved, well, what do you make of a half Jew, half Gentile? And you see how very gentle the Lord is, very gentle in teaching us, bit by bit, nudge, nudge. It's not like this is the truth, if you accept it, believe or perish or whatever. He wants to save people and he's very gentle with us. And that's why it's two steps back and three steps forward in a lot of cases in our lives, be it struggling with addiction, be it understanding things. He's very patient because he wants to help us to come to him. So, I'll say, this woman who is half Jewish and half Greek, uh, you know, if you think that salvation is only for Jews, well, what, what do you make of this woman? Is salvation for the, the half race, you know, the mixed race people, or not? Anyway, and this woman was a very good woman, full of good works. And in those days she fell sick and died. And when they'd washed her, they laid her in an upper room. You wonder why they washed her. Well, what's going to happen is that Peter's going to resurrect her. And so you wonder if that is some reference to baptism, that she was washed. And they laid her in an upper room. And as Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Come to us without delay. Now, we're going to read in chapter 10 that... Peter has a similar experience. Messengers come to him saying, please come to the house of Cornelius, who is a Gentile, and come without delay. So circumstances repeated in Peter's life. Here, two men come to him saying, oh, can you come uh, to Lydda without any delay uh, to cure or to resurrect this half-Jewish, half-Gentile woman? In the next chapter, a bit later, he's going to again have messengers come to him saying, come without delay into the house of a total Gentile, Cornelius. And so circumstances repeat in your life. You may live for years with the neighbour from hell who's everlastingly doing drugs, playing loud music, you can't sleep day nor night. Ah, but then that disappears and you live for some years very calmly, with a very good neighbour, ah, oh, and then it repeats again. Again, you have a neighbour who is playing loud music and keeping you awake and being a general hassle and pain. Why does it repeat? You may say, oh, my ex, well, five exes ago, ah, she, was, she used to do this, that or the other. And then, oh, hang on. my latest partner started to do the same. And it, well, why, is, why is it the circumstances repeat in our lives like it did in Peter's life? Well, it's because life is not random and we are being taught by the Lord Jesus. He is teaching us slowly, slowly, like a school teacher does. You give the kids an exercise and then another one that, <clears throat> that basically repeats, basically repeats the exercise. And that is how Jesus is with us. 
And it's amazing that all the millions of people he's working with, it's like a sort of personalised, tailor-made, individual path for each of us. I'll give you this experience, and then a few years later, a month later, I'll give you the same experience again. And this, as I say, is what happened with Peter. He gets two people, messengers come to him saying, come without delay to this half-Jewish, half-Greek woman. And then you're going to read the next chapter that again messengers come to him and say, come into the house of a Gentile. Well, <clears throat> Jews didn't go into the houses of Gentiles. Jews could only go into the house of another Jew. And, you know, Peter and all of them should have got this out of their head and said, no, Jesus told us to go and preach the gospel to all nations. All this is rubbish. But even people like Peter were very, very slow to get it. So it's not surprising that we are very slow to get it about a lot of things. So, verse 39, Peter rose and went with them. When he'd arrived, they brought him into the upper room. Now, Jews aren't supposed to, weren't supposed to go into the house of a Gentile. Well, who's this woman? She's half, half Jewish, half Greek. It's to sort of prod him a bit. What do you make of that then? And all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made. I suppose they were wearing them. They were showing the garments which Dorcas made. They called her Dorcas. That's the Greek name. But Peter sent them out, kneeled down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. So he uses her Hebrew name. You can deduce from that, I think, that there were both Jews and Gentiles in the same house at the same time, which was not supposed to be. And when they invite Peter to go into the house of Cornelius, he says, well, you know, it's not allowed for a Jew to go into the house of a Gentile, but okay, I will. You see, in this earlier incident, the Lord is, is sort of working with him to get him used to the idea. Now, and I say, that this is how he works with us very gently through experiences teaching you something that at the time you think well what was the point of that and it's only years later or maybe months or days later that you understand ah you know, now I see but as I said the other day in our lives nothing is random it's not that yeah there's some stuff from God the rest of it is just another throw of the dice it's just random no no as you mature you see that absolutely nothing is random, that it is all of God. It is all meant to be. And all has a purpose. And that's the worst thing when you feel that nothing's got any purpose, that there is no meaning in my life. Now, I know you can't attach meaning to events just like that. Oh, this happened because of that. Or this happened so that this is going to happen. You can't do that at the time. But in the bigger picture, you can look back and see, wow, God was using everything, even my sins. You know, you might have been a, a druggie on the street sleeping in the gutter for five years. But later on, you, you kind of see why that was in this bigger picture, in this bigger kind of fabric. So, <clears throat> verse 40, Peter sent them out. All these people are crying around the body of the dead woman. He sends them out, kneels down and prayed and turns to the body and he says, Tabitha, arise. This is exactly what Jesus did in his ministry with Peter, James and John present. Jairus' daughter dies, everyone's mourning over the girl, the girl's body. Jesus goes in there with Peter, James and John, gets them all to leave the room. He prays and he says to the girl, to the body, Talitha, very similar to Tabitha. It's time to get up. Arise. And she opened her eyes when she saw Peter. She sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Exactly as Jesus did to Jairus' daughter. The whole body language is the same. The wording is the same. And I think the purpose of that is to show that what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in Christ, is that you and your life, will go through the essence of things that Jesus went through in his life. This is why I say, read the Gospels. Get familiar with the Lord Jesus, with his words, his actions, his miracles. Because in the end, when things happen to you, there is a bridge that goes back 2,000 years to that man, that more than man, 
who walked the streets of Galilee and Jerusalem in Palestine 2,000 years ago. That man is not alone. And we are not alone in experience because actually everything that happens to us is to connect us with what happened to him. You know? Um, for example, when he was crucified, the whole nature of crucifixion was to bring pain to every bone of his body. That was the way this terrible torture was structured. So, let's say you've got bone pain. This uh, bone is in so much pain or that or whatever. Well, there was somebody else who had bone pain. And that's the Lord Jesus. It's so tragic when he says to his mother, when he's on the cross, he looks down and sees his mum there and says, woman, behold your son, and sort of passes her over to John to look after. Right? If you've had that sort of hard goodbye with your mother, well, there you are, somebody else did. And that person is Jesus, he's alive, he's in heaven. He looks down at your situation and he sees, as I say, that bridge between you here in Croydon and your experiences now and him 2,000 years ago. And in that sense, he is with us. In that sense, we are in Christ. That he is totally tied up with us in our lives, in our experience, in our emotions. So, he gave her his hand and raised her up and calling the saints and widows, he presented her to life. Just as Jesus did with uh, Jairus' daughter. And it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. I've been suggesting that when you read about all the people in Joppa and all the people in Sharon, and Lydda, etc., it means all the believers. But it says here that they believed in the Lord. And I suggested that this is a second sort of step up the ladder. They'd already believed. But when they saw this, they believed more strongly. So you can be a Christian, a believer, but there is the journey's not finished. There's another step up the ladder, just as when Jesus said to Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. But he was already converted. But Jesus meant, look, there's another higher step to go. And it came to pass, and that's why I said that to be rebaptized is not a sin per se. It's a rededication. That's how you feel led. A rededication to the Lord Jesus. Some people say, oh, but I was sprinkled as a kid. Yeah, that's not quite biblical baptism, but it's a good thing that that was done. Um, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing, um, but there's the other step to go up the ladder. In 43, it came to pass he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Now going back to what I said earlier, that they all struggled, these Jewish Christians, they struggled very much to believe that non-Jews, that is Gentiles, could have a chance of salvation. And it says that he stayed in Joppa, which is a, a seaside town in Israel, with Simon, a tanner. Now Simon is just the same name that Peter had, Simon Peter. And this guy is a tanner. I think it's Tanner's Yard, isn't there, somewhere around here in Croydon. A tanner was somebody who cut the skin off an animal and turned it into leather and worked it into leather. So they were dealing with blood, with animal blood, and often they used unclean animals to do the job. So this guy Simon Atana is not, although he's a Jew, he has Shimon, he, um, he has a Jewish name, he's not a very pious Jew because no pious religious Jew would be a tanner dealing with Unclean animals, blood everywhere, working with, with the, uh, the carcasses of animals, working with the, the skins of animals. And he lives with this guy in Joppa. Now, the Jews, the, the Pharisees, had a law that said if a man is a tanner, he's not a true Jew, and he must live the equivalent of like two kilometers outside the city limits. Well, <clears throat> yeah... This guy, Simon, is a tanner, so he didn't live right in the city centre, he lived on the edge. And why does Peter stay with him? I assume because the guy was renting a room and 
he didn't have a lot of money. And yeah, to stay with a, a tanner who lived a bit out of town, yeah, that's where the cheapest room was. The cheapest room, the cheapest accommodation. Peter was not a wealthy guy, as he says, he was a fisherman. And so again, this is Jesus nudge nudging him, because he would have thought, wow, uh, this guy is a tanner, um, yeah, but he's a nice bloke, and I'm living in his house. Um, hmm. And you see, all this is going to prepare him for the next chapter where messengers come to Peter and there's a knock on the door, ding dong. Hey, can you, can you come basically and baptise a total Gentile Roman centurion called Cornelius? But you see how the Lord has led him very gently to this point. Same way when uh, John's going to be baptised, or the others of you this afternoon, the Lord has worked very gently with you all and with me and all of us all the days of our lives up to this point and he will continue to do so. There may be two steps backward but there will be three steps forward. That definitely happens. And in the bigger picture at the end of our days when all is said and done in this world you're going to see that wow, God was in everything in my little life. He was in everything. Nothing was random. Everything was his hand. Even the stuff that I thought was my mess up, all the stuff that I thought was random, there's nothing significant, it's all significant. Everything is meaningful. No reason for depression. Thinking that life is just without meaning. There is ultimately this great meaning because God wishes, as Moses says, to do us good at our latter end, in the end of all things. So, all of this finally is possible because of the work of Jesus. I'd like to hand out the uh, bread of the cup. It is him and his death and resurrection, as we sing in that song, that makes life worth the living. And life is worth the living because he lives. <laughs> So life is worth the living because he lives. So this is what puts everything into its perspective. That he died and rose again and is coming again. And he's not, he's not doing nothing up in heaven. He is working very carefully in our lives. Bringing about circumstance, bringing about situation so that we come finally to salvation. So don't think that Jesus is sort of up there, sitting around doing nothing, chatting with the angels, waiting for the alarm clock to go off and then he can come back to earth. No, he, he is very active. He's an active Lord, very, very active in human life. So... Let's give thanks to God for the bread and the cup. Paul says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Heavenly Father, through the Lord, we thank you for this bread, we thank you for this cup, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. And we pray that we might truly identify with him, that we might live with him and for him and in him, and that he might live in and through us, through his spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Cindy and Shay, for the uh, food we can smell. Let's just give a word of thanks for the food. Let's just have a prayer for the food, guys.